looking at the context of it. So here you are, you see this is a, this is a picture of me. And uh, in 2017, uh, I was approached, all our school were approached by the BBC. Um, and they wanted to, to, to film a documentary. And they had looked at uh, what was going on in places like Finland uh, and Norway and how gender equality had really worked there. So they wanted to try and replicate that within um, a school in the UK. So they emailed our school and our head teacher, she forwarded it on to me and uh, I said, you know what, it's not something I've ever thought of before. When we do our teacher training, you know, we're not taught about treating boys and girls the same. Um, so I'm really up for it. So we said yes. And after several uh, visits from the, the company, the production company, they chose our school. And this is a, a this is a picture um, of us on the beach. We went to the beach uh, for one of our sessions and it looks lovely there. It was really hot and sunny like it is at the moment, but um, it wasn't the best day in the world, unfortunately, because uh, uh, a couple of our children were sick and uh, I was late back to school and parents were waiting and I got into trouble. So um, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the best of days. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm going to go through some slides, uh, give you some information about what happened during the documentary, the things that I found out and um, some tips that you can take back and use within your classroom um, or at home, um, to be honest. Uh, things that, that I found would, ho would hopefully work, would work within my classroom and within our school. And it's not things that will cost you an awful lot of money, I hope. So I've also, <laughs> quick plug for this as well, I've also, uh, since the documentary, uh, co-written a book with Lucy Rykos Smith called The Equal Classroom life-changing thinking about gender. If, uh, if you're interested in it, I'd, I'd love to sign it one and send it to you. But um, at the moment, you can get them sort of on, on um, from the Rutledge website and from Amazon. But there's, a, there's only one review at the moment, one review of the Equal Classroom, and it was me that reviewed it. So <laughs> but it's a very good book, it's a great read. Um, this was my classroom. This is what it looked like for six weeks. Uh, it was extremely tiring. Um, the kids were amazing, to be honest. They, they adapted to it so, so quickly. Um, you know, imagine having just cameras and microphones and the ki kids being mic'd up for six, every day for six weeks. Um, you'd imagine it would be quite, uh, it would have an impact on them, but it really didn't. And uh, they were super. It was, it, it was, it was a fantastic, it, it was a fascinating um, project to do. I don't want to call it an experiment, a project to do because like I say, it wasn't something I'd ever thought of before, the way I talk to my children and the things that can impact on how they see themselves. Um, and it's had a, a profound effect on me since then as well and the work that I've been doing. So it was, uh, it was brilliant. Uh, this, is, this is me again. This is um, a quote that I, I did and let Toys Be Toys made it into a really nice slide. Um, the gender neutral teaching is not about making boys and girls the same. Do you know what? If boys want to like blue and love football and climb trees and be adventurous, that's exact. That's that's fine. And if girls want to love unicorns and pink and sparkles, that's fine as well. But actually, what we want to do is through gender neutral teaching, uh, give both boys and girls the same opportunities. So actually, boys they want to love unicorns and and pink and sparkles. Then yes, they can. And if girls want to climb trees and play football then they can too so it's about actually giving them the same opportunities in life but also not having preconceived expectations of what children can and can't do because of their gender and i'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a later slide when they first came in the, the team did a series of diagnostic tests so they got some so they brought some scientists in and uh, one of the tests that they did was they talked to the children they gave children different emotions so they said oh um happy or sad, um, angry. And what the children then had to do was they had to think of other vocabulary linked to that word. And girls were really good at this. Girls could, girls could, you know, they could reel off lots of vocabulary linked to emotions, but boys really struggled. They struggled to, um, to think of other words except for words for anger. Um, they really struggled to talk about any other emotion at all. Um, and we, we think in part that's because of the way um, society looks at boys, the way that society says to boys, do you know what, um, you, you've got to man up, you can't cry, boys aren't allowed to cry, they're not allowed to show their emotions. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot from parents uh, and from society, we expect our boys not to show emotions 
And actually, if we do, what boys do, then it's a sign of weakness, um, which we know is mad, but that's the way it is sometimes. Um, here's a couple of examples here. I think of uh, what people have heard. I've heard a nine-year-old boy tell a crying five-year-old boy to stop crying and man up. It broke my heart knowing they both will grow up being afraid to express sadness freely because society says that boys shouldn't cry. Um, of all of the things that we found out in the documentary, um, it, getting boys to talk about their emotions has been the hardest, hardest challenge. And it still is. Um, it's really, it's so ingrained within boys that, you know, they, they've got to be the best. Um, they're not allowed to show their emotions, but actually um, it's, it's really difficult. So um, it was our challenge. And again, there are things like this. There are clothes out there that says, you know, boys will always louder, the better. Rad like dad, really, really cool. Again, there's all this pressure on boys to, to be a certain thing. You know, um, and not all boys are like that. Not but all boys want to be, you know, loud. Um, they don't want to all be like their dad. They don't want to like tools and things like that. Uh, and actually the expectation of boys to be boys, what does that mean for a boy to be a boy? And of course, this then leads on, uh, if boys can't talk about their emotions, it leads on to them uh, not being able to talk about their emotions when they're, when they're older. And of course, this then leads to um, male suicide, which is one of the biggest uh, killers of, of, of young men uh, under 50, which is Matt Haig there, if you don't follow him on Twitter, he talks about this a lot. Um, but men, or only 38% of NHS referrals, but of course, 78% of deaths by suicide are male. It's because um, females go and find someone to talk to, whereas men, again, think that it's, it's a weakness if they don't, if they're, they're showing a weakness, that they're, they're showing their emotions. And what we also found was that boys, their self-esteem, like 50% of the boys said that they were best. So we asked the boys who are best, boys or girls, and 50% of the boys said, yes, we are the best, boys are the best and only 10% of girls said they were the best. So girls' self-esteem was something we had to really work upon. Um, and actually, in, in a way, that was that was easier, a lot easier, actually, than getting the boys to talk about their emotions because we went in and we said, do you know what, girls, you can be whatever you want to be. You're amazing, you're fantastic. Um, and because we kept telling them this and some of the, the, the little um, things that they put in place, the little uh, tasks, et cetera, Kept telling girls that they were brilliant, their self -esteem, their self esteem grew, and actually, our year six, these girls, these these children now are in year six. Um, all of the girls that took part in this documentary, their self esteem is flown up, their confidence is is amazing. Um, they're brilliant. Um, so that that in a way was a lot easier than getting the boys to talk about their emotions. Um, what we do find with girls, of course, though, is that there is this that uh, um, that they, they, they're not shown in um, books in a good light or in films um, they don't have these role models it is getting better but they don't have the role models that, that boys sometimes do so if you look at this breaking down uh, Disney dialogue um, the, the ones on the left show men with the most dialogue and then we've got a gen we've got a balance there and then of course we've got on the right there where women um, have most dialogue and again you've only got four films there it is getting better I know people are more aware of it but um, it's not so not that's not so much represent, representation there for the for the girls, uh, and then there are again there are things like this that you know are telling girls each time that, that um, they can't do certain things. So oh, I'm too pretty for maths, allergic to algebra, um, I'm too pretty to do my homework, so my brother has to do it for me. All of these are messages that actually, when you look at me, think oh, they, you know that when you look at these, that's not. It's just a bit of fun, isn't it? But it isn't if girls keep getting these messages uh, time and time again, they will start to believe that actually, you know, I don't like maths. I am too pretty doing maths. Um, and down here, you see like training to be Batman for the boys and training to be Batman's wife for the girls. The worst one I've seen uh, was uh, a baby's hat. It was a baby's, a pink baby's hat. And on there it said, future footballer's wife's uh, wife. So again, it's about those aspirations for the girls. Uh, it's everywhere and you start to look out so we've got your pink chemistry set which is you know aimed for the girls and we've got the revolting science one which is aimed for the boys i know which one i'd rather get and i'm sure there's many girls that would rather have uh, this revolting science one down here um there was a uh, there was a laptop actually it was out over christmas and the get the features on the girls there were less features on the girls laptop um, that was pink uh, than the boys laptop crazy again if you 
if you go into Google and you Google um, computer science, if you uh, girls in ICT, the, the pictures at the top there uh, are what you get. So you get pink laptops and uh, etc. And then if you put uh, boys in ICT, uh, you get the nice pictures down there, them together, programming. Um, so that again, the, even the diagnostics on, on Google are against gender equality. Um, there are silly things like, you know, the Kinder Eggs, um, Mr. and Mrs. Egg, and you start looking at them and you think, wow, why don't we just have an egg of one colour and a variety of mix of all those different toys rather than the gendered stuff we can see there. Uh, even soup can be gendered. So we've got uh, soup for champions in blue there and we've got the um, glamour green soup uh, on the right. Um, gendered soup, who knew, eh? Um, so going on to some tips. So quality tip number one, look for unconscious bias in your work setting. You may be surprised on what you find. So. Um, this was something that I knew would be raised when we did the documentary. Uh, basically, they came in and they watched me teach for an hour. And every time I use, I use terms of endearment with my children. Um, I used to anyway. Um, I used to think it was part of my, you know, my relationship with them. I put them at ease. And um, what I didn't realise that every time I was using one of those terms of endearment, I was telling the boys and the girls that they, they were different. The girls, because I used to use things like, love and sweetheart um the girls are sweet and lovely and that uh, with the boys i said mate and fella so you know they were tough and big and everything else so every time i used the term of endearment um the children would then stick a sticker uh, on the chart uh on the love or mate uh and i like when they watched me i used a term of endearment in an hour less than 140 times um so it was a problem it was a massive problem and because we wanted the children to change and the, the school to be on board and the parents etc I had to change, so I did. I and I started using their their, their names instead. Um, as I get older, sometimes I call them a different name, but um, uh, I have stopped using these terms of endearment. Um, it was it was hardish to start with, but actually by the end of this Easter, the six weeks, I'd used the term of endearment about twenty four times. So for going from one hundred and forty within an hour to twenty four within six weeks, I think was pretty good. I was quite proud of myself. Um, but it's also things like uh, when you're working with children, try not to use uh, gender specific terms like um, policeman or, you know, fireman, uh, a chairman, so chairperson or flight attendant. Um, sort of saying choose a boy, choose a friend. Try not to have lines, you know, lines that are separate boys and girls or praise uh, the girls, for, you know. Or say to the boys can you line up as well as the girls or something like that. try not to do that i know it's really difficult sometimes but try not to um try not to assign different different roles to gender say boys moving desks or benches or anything else like that um and girls tidying up the, the home corner or your classroom um it, again it's hard but it's something that you can do quite easily within your classroom um you can you can monitor that and it does have a big impact really does have a big impact on uh, how kids perceive themselves and uh, how they perceive each other as well. Um, try not to stereotype the children, you know, boys are noisy and loud and girls are calm and sweet because actually, you know, boys can be sensitive and caring and quiet and girls can be loud and cranky. Um, these are posters from Elise Gravel and you can find them on her website, they are free. Um, we do have these up around the school and the classrooms and things. Um, they're just a little reminder for children that you know, it doesn't matter who you are, boy or girl, you can feel all these emotions and actually that's all right. Um, tip number two, use books with positive female role models and books that challenge stereotypical norms. OK, so um, this was again, this was something that, that uh, the production team came into my classroom and they went through my book corner and I had a lot of stereotypical books. So I had a lot of Beast Quest books for the boys and I had the fairy books for the girls. Um, and at the time, I thought, you know, what? I just want my boys and girls to read. If I go to the books, book people or the works and, and buy these for them, then it doesn't really matter about. And I never thought about, you know, um, representation with the books, but, you know, really positive female models and uh, showing that they can be caring. Um, <laughs> this is just a quick so I quite like this one because um, it looks at princesses in books and how they spend their time. Um, I spend my time doing a lot of those things. <laughs> it's not just princesses. <laughs> uh, 
and so they get, again they came in and i was very lucky that they, that they they bought a lot of books and we so we threw the others out and we bought in a lot of books like the sissy duck doing the my princess boy um the paper bag princess in fact the books uh the books had a bigger impact uh, on my boys than anything else um, because they could then start talking about their feelings because they could see that actually that that was what was happening within these books that boys could talk about their feelings that they could be caring that could be gentle um, so books were brilliant for that um, if you go to the the, the gender gender collect uh, website they've got a whole host of brilliant books there um, there's the link down below uh, gender collect is brilliant on, um, on one of the team for the gender collect but there are loads of great books there um, stereotype busting books um, and, and something else we looked at uh, that you know boys don't often and girls don't often get positive male role models in nurseries and schools we are um, underrepresented with younger children which is a bit of a shame really because it's something I've always always I've always been part of because before I was a TA, I was a nanny, I, I did my NNEB. Um, I always wanted to work with children. Um, so again, I don't, I don't really understand why it is, why it is that men don't want to come into this role. Uh, I've looked into it a little bit and I'll show you in a minute the, the reasons behind why I think they haven't. Um, but it's not just a problem in, in the UK, obviously that 2% is, is really low and that's 2014. I don't think it's gone up a lot since then, to be honest. Um, it's, it's a problem worldwide that men are not employed in childcare. Uh, you might find them in secondary, but unfortunately you don't find them working with young children. It's really those young children that need to see us as positive male, model, male, <laughs> positive male role models. Um, but they show us working with younger children, uh, playing, uh, caring, um, showing our emotions. Um, and so it's just 14% of the early years and primary workforce are male. So um, we, I think we've been striving and trying for a long time to try and get more men into, into primary care. Um, and it is slowly getting better. I think you see, sort of see the presence on Twitter of, of males and men in primary of doing a talk tonight at eight o'clock. Um, so for things like that, it's really good, but uh, I, uh, it is important for boys to experience men in care and nurturing roles. Um, because actually we want them to grow up to be caring, nurturing boys. Um, Robert Webb, if you've not read Robert's Webb, Robert Webb's book, I reviewed it last week. Um, and it's uh, on uh, something for Mark, ICC and Evangelist. Um, and he, it's, it's, it's biographical, but it talks about him growing up and the expectations from his dad on him to be, you know, to, to want to drink and to go out and to love football. And, Actually, he never wanted any of those things. He just wanted to, you know, care. And um, the pressure on him really got to him. Uh, and he felt he, he was letting his dad down when he didn't adhere to the expectations of his dad. So it's a really great book. So please read it. It's fantastic. Um, and again, uh, there's this lovely little picture here of, about there's this boy here with a little baby doll. Um, and actually some people come out and say, you know what, you know, that's, that's wrong. It, it's not wrong. You know, we want our boys to grow up to be fathers that are caring and are comfortable with children. Um, challenge typical gender of career roles. This is one of the, this is one of my favorite parts of the, the documentary. So what, what we got the children to do um, is to draw within these boxes on the right here, um, a dancer, a car mechanic, a magician, and a makeup artist. And uh, the children, of course, well, not of course, but the children put stereotypical roles. So a female ballet dancer, male mechanic, male magician, and a female makeup artist. And nearly all of the children did that. And then what they did afterwards was they then took them into this room. And within this room, there was a, a male ballet dancer, a female mechanic, a female magician and a male makeup artist and it that, that it blew the children's minds um they were so inspired by these people that you know broke their typical gender stereotypical views um the, the dancer there found he was fantastic when i asked the boys afterwards who was the person that you inspired you the most um it, it was him he was he was brilliant and uh, i joined in as well and as you can see there's me um doing a bit of dancing 
I was hoping to get on to uh, Strictly Come Dancing with that, but it's not happened yet. Um, again, make it part of the fabric of your classroom. We've been talking a lot about inclusion um, and diversity over the last few weeks because of what's happened. Um, it's no good just having like a, a gender day or a gender week. Um, you need it to be part of your classroom. So we've got these little signs up around the classroom that say boys are funny, girls are funny, um, girls girls care, boys care, girls are great at maths, boys are great at maths, you know, all of these different signs. And what I do as well is every few weeks or so, I get the children to move them around. So they're not wallpaper, but they get up, put them somewhere else. And uh, they, 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 they then don't think that they're just there and they just forget all about them. Um, we've also got these wonderful pictures that are up around the classroom showing, you know, uh, women firefighters and uh, male makeup artists. Um, and again, the more that children can see these and think that they're, they're normal, that it's part of the norm, then uh, the better, better really for society. We also make sure that actually we've started to look at our curriculum. Um, we, we did look at the curriculum to look at gender equality, but, but now because of what's happened, um, we started to look at it as um, diversity. So what we did do, and we, this, this on the left here is our, our topic jigsaw, and this is where we plan and we had a gender equality section on it um, but now we're going to change that to diversity so we are going to include gender equality but we're also going to include um, diverse cultures etc um, because of what's happened these are my children um, these are the children they're, they're, they're only year six or four year sixes um, on the left there you can see that's um, that's Amber and she uh, hated football. She really didn't like football at all until we did the documentary. Uh, and actually when we played it on the beach, uh, because the children played uh, soccer there, football there, um, she, she refused to do it. And then we managed to talk her around and she played it for the first time ever and she loved it. Uh, and there she is in her football kit. She started playing for a football team. Um, the tiny little picture with the screen in the background, that's um, Niall, Niall, he's, he's moved to Scotland, unfortunately, but Niall, uh, his mum contacted me during the summer after the documentary saying that uh, Niall couldn't, she, could, she was trying to get some school shoes for him, um, but she couldn't buy any because every shoe, sh shoe shop he went into, uh, she went into, um, he would go up to the, the manageress or manager and say, um, unfortunately, you haven't got any gender neutral shoes. I'm not buying any from here. So she struggled to get any shoes. There's Finn and his sister Ava in the middle there. And they, they didn't really get on too well, but after the doc, this is what we found actually, after the documentary that boys and girls had a bit greater respect for each other. Uh, and there's Finn playing with his sister with the loom bands. And just on the right there, um, there's Fred. And he's he always wanted to be uh, a baker and he felt that it was a female role. So he didn't bake, um, but after the documentary he did. And that's, that's his first attempt at uh, cake. I did try some, it wasn't good. So afterwards, uh, after the six weeks, uh, and there, you can watch the documentary, it is on YouTube. I, uh, please do, uh, it is fantastic. There are lots and lots of things I haven't been able to talk about that are on there. Um, and if you do watch it and you want, if you've got any other questions about it, then please ask me, just don't look in the comment sections on YouTube. I do sometimes and wished I didn't. <laughs> It's a strange world. So at the end of it, the self-esteem difference between boys and girls is at 0.2%. Like I say, the girls' confidence really grew through those six weeks. The boys' pro-social behaviour was up 10%. The, the behaviour of the boys was much better. Um, and I think that was because they had a better understanding of the, what the girls, uh, the greater, uh, they, were, they were just um, happier and able to talk about their relations more, most of them, not all of them. Uh, a girls football team um, started excelling before the documentary and I'm taking the credit for this. They couldn't win a game and then they became champions of the Isle of Wight. Uh, our boys um, started uh, a ballet club and they opened up for our local um, ballet works, which was like a, a touring company and they opened up for them and it was fantastic. You can find that on YouTube. I watch it and every time I watch it, I cry. It's amazing. Um, there we go. There's our girls. It also had a big impact because everybody likes data. It had a big impact upon um, our girls' maths um, because they, before the documentary, they just felt they couldn't do it. Uh, and then afterwards, it just increased. It went off the scale. 
and then the same with the boys with literacy. There's a couple of our children, there's Louis um, and, and Lily, poor old Lily, she fell off her scooter just before the end of the documentary, so that's why her face is like that. Um, it is everywhere now, uh, people are talking about it, but I still think we've got a long way to go before um, quality is, is something that we don't have to talk about, and that's the thing I want. I want us not to have to have these conversations and talk about equality because um, it means we've done our job then. These are my two wishes for gender equality, that we can help our boys to express their emotions, to talk about how they are feeling, um, and that may have an impact on the number of men who die by suicide. Um, if we can get our boys to talk about it, then it means that our, they will grow up to be men that can talk about it, um, because it's such a sad loss of life. And of course, increase our girls' confidence, so that when they're older, they feel confident to challenge when they feel something is wrong, to feel that they can achieve anything. Um, and in light of what's happened in Hollywood in the last few years, I think that's something that we need to do as well. Girls need to be able to challenge um, what's going on. Um, there's uh, me at the BAFTAs, we didn't win unfortunately, um, but I did manage to get my hands on one from the Panor Panorama team and meet some lovely people. Right, I was gonna stop my share. Hey, thank you so much. That was brilliant. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm catching up on the questions here. Thanks, Flavia. And then, uh, great. Uh, so let me put my video on again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> uh, great. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with the questions with the order that they were. Lovely. Thank typed. you. I'll do my then, best to answer them. I'm yeah. no expert. I'm really not. I'm still learning myself. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, okay. So Vic asked if you recommend dropping all these terms of endearment or is it better to just use them for everybody all the so call all the students darlings or pickles yeah that's a, that's a really good question um and we did talk to the children about this actually we asked the children and went to them and said look if i if i call you all sweet pea or love um how do you feel about that and of course because of, you know because previously i'd called the girls love and sweet pea etc and the boys mate and fella um the boys weren't too enamoured with that. It is you can see it on the on the um, on the documentary. You do ask them, uh, and so basically, what we thought was it's best just to drop all terms of endearment and just use their names. And actually, I thought it would impact upon my relationship with the children, but it really hasn't. Yeah, I think that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. um, there is a, a question from Nikki. There was actually something I was going to ask anyway, uh, so I'm glad she asked. Uh, what are some of the practical ways that we can increase general self-esteem or especially girls' self-esteem in the classroom as teachers? Or like some practical activities that we can do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do feel that the, the books are brilliant. The books, not just for, for boys, you know, uh, to help them talk about their feelings, but girls, um, positive role models within those books. I mean, there are so many really good books with positive female role models now. But even if you can't, um, even if you can't find or you haven't got the money to buy yeah. these books look at look at the look at the literature that you have got and then challenge it you know um look at stories like snow white and sleeping beauty and say well well do you know sleeping beauty she she basically she fell asleep and the first man that that kissed her she married do you think that's is that a good is that a good role model is that a good are they aspirations for you as a, as a female so yeah, yeah challenge those but um the books if you can the books were brilliant for that and actually just keep telling girls that they can do it you know that positive language the little signs around the classroom that i talked about they really helped too i just think that that sort of drip feeding of especially if you can start it as early as you can um yeah. there was a that that there was um a, in they did some research in america about it actually about girls and how they felt about themselves and um, what they did was they went into the, the kindergarten and they said to the children, uh, who's better, boys or girls? And at that age, boys and girls both, you know, boys said boys and girls said girls. Mm. Um, but then they asked them again a year later, and then sort of, you know, year one, our, our year. Uh, and it was then that it changed. So something changes between reception and year one. Um, and it's the girls that turn around and said, you know, our boys are better at all sorts of things than, than we are. So um, if we can get in and get these positive messages into our children as soon as possible, then that'll help as they go through. Yeah, 
Uh, so I'm gonna follow up from that. There were lots of questions from different people saying that they teach at A levels or they teach year 11, year 12. Is it too late to start working with those older kids? Obviously we have to start earlier, but is that something that we can do with the older kids that we can still change? Yeah, no, no, do you know what I would, I would still do it. I would still have a go. Um, if you don't, if you don't, then, you know, you sort of lost them. So I would, I would have a go. I've got a, a padlet of resources, not just for primary school, but for secondary schools as well. There's some really great secondary school stuff out there. Um, and I can, I can share that as well uh, with you, but yeah, I would, I would definitely look at it. Um, and I'd, I'd start looking at things that, you know, within the news maybe looking at things like tennis and the, the stuff that's happened recently with costumes and you know men can basically wear what they like but girls can't and uh you know men could take their top off to change their shirts but the, you know, the girls couldn't so um use it as a debate tool really mm -hmm. if you can start doing that then um i i think that, yeah please do yeah any age children yeah <laughs> good uh, so lots of people asking for those uh, links that you just mentioned the resources uh, yeah if you can sure, share that later. Sure. yeah we get yeah that. yeah, yeah um definitely. right uh so let me go back to my questions here jennifer said that a lot of the girls that she teaches are very concerned about the looks of their work like putting a lot of effort into making it look pretty and yeah. that she worries that that hinders the actual learning yeah, do you know what? Again, I think that I think that might be a bit of an expectation um, from from early uh, within within like children's careers, and not not just from from teachers, but I think probably from home as well that we expect mm -hmm. our girls to be you know sat and uh, everything to be neat and their handwriting to be beautiful, uh, and I think there's that, there's that pressure on our girls to to do that um, to conform to that that stereotype, whereas boys, you know, sort of. Uh, we expect them to our uh, expectations sometimes for the boys are maybe a bit lower that we just don't that we don't expect it to be as neat as the girls or for them to take their time over it um i think we need to and again i think this is something we need to look at uh younger you know um, preschool reception year one that we expect both boys and girls to take their time for their work to be neat that we, we've got the same expectations um yes yeah, that's a really that's a really hard one I think, because i think that's something that's probably ingrained early on and, mm -hmm. and I think we do that sometimes as adults we sort of you know boys let boys be boys and you know girls be girls but actually we want to treat them the same and um, have the same expectations of, of each and actually sometimes we want our girls to be messy you know and not to care about their yeah. work too much and yeah and our boys to take their time over it and things like that I think it's yeah. a yeah, it's about our expectations and, ch and trying to change them if we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, there was more like a comment from Annie. So you talked about not uh, not being in a lot, of, a lot of male teachers for early years, mm -hmm. but then she said the same happens for some subjects. So she is a social science teacher and she says mostly women teachers. Yeah. And there she thinks that kids will end up with different stereotypes about that topic. Yeah. because they only see female or male teachers so do you have any comments about that yeah again the, do you know what you're right that's really really difficult and it's uh, i mean it's uh, we've got these um initiatives to try and get girls into coding and to the stem careers and boys into arts more and i think it's almost like a generational thing that, that, that w it will change but it's it's going to take a long time for it to change um it it's difficult it's really hard and it's a shame that we can't get more representation of those you know those different mm -hmm. subjects for our children but uh, yeah. we, I think we're trying <laughs> I think yeah. we're trying but it, it is hard um the gender like I say the gender collector I'm I'm part of they're trying to find they, they're working with schools and businesses and homes and one of the one of the things they're doing with, when they work with businesses is trying to find um gender stereotypes so they're trying to find female mechanics, male makeup artists, etc. So that they can go into schools or they can Zoom chat into schools so that kids can see that actually there, there is that representation that mm -hmm. men can be makeup artists and dancers, etc. And women yeah. can be mechanics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then Thomas and Jacqueline asked similar questions. 
they both said that they have tried some of those ideas or something similar. And then a lot of their colleagues don't really like it or say no. it's not really <laughs> important. So how can you help your colleagues see the importance of that and having like a whole school approach? Yeah, do you know what? That's, that's, that's really good. I mean, actually we, was, we, we did it within our school and actually our, our whole school on board now because you know, we did a documentary in the BBC we're in. So we had the pressure to do that and the parents yeah. who all came on board. Um, but for those that haven't had a documentary crew come in and write a documentary, I would, I would start off by um, maybe having a, a staff meeting uh, or giving the, 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 your, your staff the task to watch the documentary. Because I think if you watch the doc documentary and see the impact it's had on the children, um, that I don't think there's any way that you cannot think it's a good, it's a good thing to do. Um, it is a good thing to do. It's yeah. a, uh, when we look at diversity, in, in anything um, it's something that we need to look at and we need to bring to our children because of course if we don't then in the future it's not it's not going to be so great so yeah I would I'll give them some homework say watch the documentary Mr Andre the, the man that was on it has said that you've got to do this <laughs> and then if you have any questions please contact me if they come back and say well why did you do this or why did you do that or I don't believe you should have done this or whatever let me know and um, I'll contact I'll phone them up I'll tweet them or something but uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get them to watch it first of all just to see the impact it has it mm -hmm. it has quite an impact yeah. show them the evidence show yeah. them the evidence exactly. <laughs> yeah um somebody sorry i didn't catch the name i forgot to write down uh asked about differences in motor skills and uh -huh. uh, between boys and girls when they're very young so could they help them have different views about boys and girls saying so the girls saying the boys are better yeah when they are year one because boys are better at some skills at that yeah age. i see what you're saying there. yeah um the, the, there is some evidence to that i mean we had we had gina rippon who was on the documentary and she's a, a neuroscientist uh, and she's done a lot of work on looking at the brain um, mm -hmm. and she's actually said when when children are born there's very little difference uh, between them there's there are more similarities and there are differences between the, the male and female brain so um, she's done a lot of work saying that actually it is outside influences that influence uh, how our children behave and their expectations um, I, I, I don't to be honest it's not my area I don't really know about the, the, the motor skills I know there are differences between boys and girls in, in motor skills and the way that they develop at different rates um, but again I think if, if we can, if we expect the same of our boys and girls from an early age, even if they do have developmental differences, then um, we, we want our boys and girls to think that they're, they're equal. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can tell them that as soon as, <laughs> as young as we can, and hopefully they'll think they're equal. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that came out of the documentary, um, one of the diagnostics they did is the, the little diagnostics where ch the children had a bank of statements and they had to talk about themselves and tick off. Um, and one of the things that really hit me was one of the girls, uh, Amber actually uses the little footballer that you saw, uh, she, she described herself as ugly. And, and I thought, you know, for any girl at eight years old to think that she's ugly at that age um, was really quite sad. Um, so yeah, we want to turn, we want our girls to not think, you know, we want those yeah. who have, um, a, a, that they, they believe in themselves. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so Thomas asked about parents. <laughs> How do we approach parents? He said that he tried pantomime with his year eight kids and that they were supposed to be bring costumes for cross-gendered roles, but then the parents didn't like them. Yeah. Um, how do we do with parents yeah do you know what it's it's really hard isn't it um we we, we were sort of in the like a false when we brought it to our school it was false because of course it was part of a documentary so our parents came on board quite quickly um because we had the bbc come in and talk to them mm. and do meetings etc um there's somebody jordan day um who's at jordan day um he has, has brought it into his school, and I know there are several other schools that have brought it in as well. And basically, he, that was what he did first of all. He, he got to the parents and he did a, 
a staff meeting with the parents, I think they used several clips from the documentary to show them the impact that having the gender equality can have on their children and uh, actually the bad that it can do, the negative impact it can have on uh, boys and girls. Um, and so we went to do it that way. I think um, if you do want to do this, then have a meeting with the parents, show them parts of the documentary, um, tell them the reasons why you're doing it. And the Gender Collective have got some really good guidelines on their website as well. Um, and you're not going to get everybody on board. We didn't actually, we had one parent that you know didn't want anything to do with it. And if you, you can't really do anything about that, but because of that one parent, you can't not do it. So we carried on. Um, and I think by the end of it, they saw, they, they saw actually it, it was worthwhile. It was something that we should be doing within school. So just go for it, do it. Yeah. Do you think it's more, that's my question. Do you think it's more the parents of the boys that yes. are yes, against them? Definitely. Yeah. It was the parents of the boys. Because yeah. I think what sometimes what they, what they think is that if you're doing something like this and you're saying, you know, there's an expectation of our boys not to cry or, um, you're expecting your boys to, to win all the time and be the best and actually when they're not the best then that's when they have a meltdown and, and get upset. I think they feel personally that you're having a bit of an attack on them sometimes. So it was boys, it was parents of boys that were <laughs> yeah. harder to get on board. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> uh, Toria, so she just asked there again, you were the next one on my list, Toria, but um, how did you get your boys to talk about their emotions? Did you do that as a whole class practice or how did you do that? Yeah, do you know what? It's, we, we use, like on most schools, I think we use circle time. So um, if we were using a book, we, I'd read a book, uh, like about 10,000 dresses, or um, there's one called The Flower, which is about a boy who's, you know, he's in his, his house and what he wants to do is he wants to, to grow flowers. Um, and we sit and we talk about what's what's happened in the book and talk about how he would have felt at different stages. Uh, and I think that's the best way of doing it, because um, actually once you once you started doing it that way as a whole class, um, children started talking and they felt more comfortable um, talking around each other. And someone would say something. Yeah, I, you know what? I really like growing flowers and it's something I like to do. And one of the other boys would say, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I like? You know, I really like sewing, actually. And you, know, you, you sort of get the children talking to each other and it, it can be quite therapeutic for them. So I've done it as a whole class. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of discussion. I don't know if you were looking at the chat just before the about the word feminist and feminism that has a bad connotation in some groups. Some people think it means something that it doesn't really or means more than it does. So how can we change the negative connotation that the word feminism I has. think I think we need more men um, I think we need to uh, and, and it's I mean our Twitter is quite a good place for that you know we, we men are quite supportive of, of women ed um, so yeah I think it, it, it does need men to to embrace it and actually feminism is a good thing not just for men but for women and not just for women but for men as well so men embrace feminism we need to do it we need each other you mm -hmm. know yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, uh, Nicola uh, said that you were talking about not having only a day or only a week, like a girl's week or a girl's boy, uh, make this fabric. And she was asking, how do you make it fabric? In, okay. Uh, in school? Um, so we in, in our classroom, um, in our classrooms all around the school, we do have uh, a gender equality board. So we make sure that we have um, pictures up there showing non-stereotypical roles. Um, we do make sure that we have the signs, like I was saying, all around the classroom. We make sure that we're using, we make sure that actually when we look at science um, and good examples of scientists, we're not just looking at uh, white males, dead white males often, but we are looking at the females um, all the way through history, geography, make sure that the representation is not, not, not just um, men, but there's, there's women as well. Um, we also, let me have another thing, what else have we got? Um, we also debate a lot. We've got uh, quite a um, focus on oracy. So quite, uh, and again, on the Padlet that I've got, there are quite a lot of uh, debate questions that you can start on there. So um, are men or women better at looking after children uh, is one of the questions. And again, you can get some 
some really interesting debates around those sorts of questions. Should men be paid more than women, etc. So um, use those and you can really unpick it and start to bring things out. We did, we looked at, we had India as one of our topics um, last year. And again, we looked at the roles uh, in different cultures of men and women as well and how that was changing and uh, whether it's the same as our own society. So, yeah, there's no doubt there. Yeah. Um, there is a question that I also actually was thinking about that the other day. I was reviewing some Seneca content. So this question is from Dr. Prata, but I also had that in my mind. Words like man-made and mankind. Yeah. Are these a problem or are we being too that's her word pedantic in trying to discourage them um yeah. <laughs> good question i don't use those words very often so um i i think we just do the best that we can we try not to to use gendered words as much so try not to use policeman and police woman um yeah. or fireman or firewoman um, firefighter would be much better, yeah, or a police officer. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to words like mankind and things like that, yeah, it's a mankind society. Yeah, yeah. Try, and think, of, different... try and think of other words if you can. <laughs> yeah, I always go for humanity. Yeah, humanity is a good one. Yeah, we like that. We'd have to try and think of that actually. Think yeah. of all those words that have got man at the beginning. Yeah. Then do we start looking at things like the end of prayers instead of saying amen? Do we say something? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Um, Christine just shared a question here. How do you teach equality in cultures where men dominate women? I guess where laws are not as equal as in other places. Um, what we've done in the past is actually we've looked at we've looked at other cultures. Um, to, to be honest, in our school, our school is mainly it's it's white British children. Um, we don't have a lot of diversity uh, where we are, so it, it's not a big issue. But what we do do is we do look at other cultures and we do look at the way um, women are represented within those cultures uh, and compare it to to our own. And um, do you feel that it's fair? That the way mm -hmm. that women are treated, uh, we, we, we're doing Japan at the moment, so we're looking at um, Japanese women and where well, Japanese women could be emperors, they could actually, they were um, emperors, but of course then we looked at things like sumo wrestling and that, uh, that women are not allowed um, to watch sumo wrestling, not even allowed uh, anywhere near the ring, and so we talked about that and equality and um, I think it's just making children aware that you know that different countries have different cultures and different expectations but actually it, it might be we might think it's wrong but actually their culture think it's right um but we've just got to make sure that what we do within our culture uh, is correct and that everyone's equal yeah uh there's a question from vic saying that with the new sre curriculum so sexual religion relationship curriculum being rolled out in the next academic year, what do you think needs to be included, which isn't included at the moment? Is there anything we should include? Yeah, it's, um, it does mention about gender equality in there and talking about gender equality, but it's, it doesn't give you much, it doesn't tell you much in there. Um, we're, we're hoping to get some, some resources and things together with the gender collect so that when you, we do go back, uh, we can teach teach about equality. I have written a scheme of work, or we've got a, a scheme of work, but it's uh, it's only used bits and pieces that are already around on the internet, so it's not the best scheme of work ever, but it's a starting point. Um, if you did want to use it again, that's on my, on the padlet that I, I will share, but um, there is some stuff there. But um, again, it's, it's the new SRE, it doesn't give you much information about what it, but the scheme of work that I've written or, mm -hmm. you know, that's I've good. Got, but, um, you can use. So yeah, please okay. do. Yeah, if you can share that, I'm sure everybody will be appreciative. Yeah. Uh, so, Stephen asked, How did you help children understand that some people can choose to have no gender, or I guess just gender fluid, fluidity uh, in general? Again, it was, it, it's really books. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many 
brilliant picture books out there for children that show children that, that do struggle. We've got children within our school, um, quite young, that, um, that, have, that are transitioning um, their gender. So uh, I just think it's, it's, it's not about gender or, or um, diversity. It's just about accepting people for who they are. And yeah. I think the, the more that you can talk about, you know, acceptance of people, uh, whatever their choices and whoever they are, then the better. But there are lots of, it's books. Books are brilliant. Books are brilliant for anything, aren't they? Yep. <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, well, we're almost done, actually, out of time. So I'm just going to ask one more question, just in general, which is uh, how do we watch the documentary if uh, we haven't? Yeah. If, if you go to YouTube and search for it, it's called No More Boys and Girls. Right. Um, can our kids go gender free? But if you just put in No More Boys and Girls, there are two parts in there and you will yeah. find it. Quite yeah. proud of it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's fascinating. It's a really good documentary. Um, doesn't just have our school in it. It does look at outside school and parents and uh, uh, and birthday parties and clothing, etc. as well. So. It is really good. But if you've got any questions, then if you've watched it, please ask me. But don't look, like I say, in the comments. The comments are shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a lot of work to do in this country or in the world, uh, looking at the comments section. Do you think the UK is doing better or worse or the same as um, other places? I think um, there are parts of the UK that are doing all right. Right. <laughs> there's a lot of work to go yeah good uh all right so i think we're out of time thank you so much that was really 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 great i mean thank i you. learned Thanks a lot for asking me. so i'm very glad you came uh, and gave this talk and uh can you just remind people how to get in touch with you please? um you can get in touch with me on twitter um at graham andre or yeah. if you want to you can um email me at graham andre 07 at gmail.com yeah fantastic okay everybody so thank you so much that was our last teach meet of the season but we will be back in like september or so after summer so thank you very much for being here and have a lovely evening everyone thank you for coming everybody bye-bye thank you